Um, there's Spain. Uh, follow the white arrows, and that'll explain how the food gets to you. Uh, it goes to the new world where, where uh, uh, stops in Acapulco for trade. They pick up lots and lots of gold that's coming out of there to do bartering over in Manila. And then Manila becomes the outer bone to East Asia. But you have the Philippines specifically located between the New World and East Asia. So you have ingredients from East Asia coming in, you have ingredients from the New World coming in, and they all end up on your plate. And I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit more in the cookie demo at the end. So, uh, that's for why were the Americans interested in coming into the Philippines in 1898 in the first place? The story is 19th century colonialism, and that's a map of the European powers and their colonies in Southeast Asia at the end of the 19th century. So you'll see that the Philippines uh, enters into the U.S. in 1898. But before that, you have the British in India, you have the British in Malaysia, you have the French in Vietnam, you have the Dutch uh, in Indonesia, and the U.S. is late to the game. They have to compete. You know, for the U.S. to be a world power, they have to compete with the European powers that are in Southeast Asia. Thus, the U.S. is interested in the Philippines in 1998. Okay. One of the after effects that happens as well is there's this huge spike in American trade with the Philippines. So, uh, I think this goes in series. So, okay. yeah. All right, back one. Okay, hold it right there. So, if you, the, the far end of the graph is 18, well, these graphs are in here because everyone tells me about these two, it's like graphs. So, <laughs> so 1874 to 1915, green is total, blue is American. And that's total trade being conducted in imports and exports with the Philippines. Prior to 1898, the U.S. is barely even, even uh, uh, factors in there, right? It dips off in 1895 during the War of Independence. But then it starts to spike in the early 1900s and through the 1910s, uh, so that the U.S. becomes 50% majority uh, trading partner. Next slide. And it becomes really, really clear just how strong that trade partnership becomes uh, between the 1930s. So this is after multiple trade embargoes have been set up. Uh, multiple uh, tariff restrictions have been set up. And the U.S., for all those years, from 1930 to 1935, is the majority trading partner. So you can see, the, as all the other countries come into line, they really pale in comparison. And prior to this, throughout the Spanish period, the, the majority trading partners with the Philippines were Spain, obviously, uh, Great Britain, and France. The U.S. was never in the top ten, but as soon as the war, uh, the Spanish-American War happened in 1898, trade restrictions set up, the U.S. becomes the, the dominant trade partner of the Philippines. What are the repercussions for this in the food that we eat? Let's see. Next slide. The, the majority of imported foodstuffs that are coming into the Philippines are coming from the United States as well. So you can see there, 50% above all, for dairy products, wheat flour, vegetables, meat products, fish and fish products, and fruit and nuts. So everything that's coming into the Philippines is American, pretty much, okay? You can see this as well in some of the popular advertising and some of the menus that are presented in the Philippines as well. Um, this is a menu from 1896, and it, it, it'll reflect just how strongly and how valued Western cuisine was in the Philippines for exhibiting class. Uh, it's, it was a menu that was served during the dinner celebrating the independence of the Philippines from the Spanish in 1896 in a place called Mololos Pulacan. And you can see that the menu, uh, it, it's, it's, it's unfolded right now, but if you fold those, the top corner in and then the sides in as well, it's going to make the Filipino flag, which is uh, blue and red and then uh, a, tri a Masonic triangle in the center. If you fast forward, You'll actually see what this menu is. You don't, you won't see a word of Tagalog on there or a word of Spanish. It's, the entire thing is in French, and it's a classical French cuisine menu that all of us who took culinary school were subjected to cook. It's actually not that exciting, but it's the it's the meal that shows that you have class. So you've got like a, a, a soup, you've got a fish soup, some entrees, a roasted capon, you know, a, a salad, some uh, let's see, mushrooms, eggplants. Uh, green beans, uh, desserts, 
a, a bunch of wines, Bordeaux, liqueurs. Nothing in there is gonna is gonna look like anything you're eating tonight, right? And this is held an hour away from Manila to celebrate the independence of the Philippines from Spain. Why is this happening? Why is Western cuisine the one that's elevated? Part of it is a class thing, and we'll see that in the next slide as well. This is the Manila Hotel. It was established by the American government in the Philippines in 1905. Uh, it becomes the place for the American elite to celebrate and party and hold their their evening plans and the evening parties in the capital city. It's it's basically um, what would be the equivalent today? It, it's a, it's a wall city. So here's the wall city, the Manila Hotel, and the menus for the Manila Hotel as late as the 1930s. Uh, they reflect that there isn't an, an, uh, a, a focus on Filipino cuisine as well. I'm sorry that the fonts are so small, but uh, I wanted to put the entire menu on there so that you could get a sense for just how large this operation was in trying to minimize Filipino culture. Uh, it says, Dinner at Manila Hotel, the program uh, has, it begins with a, with a Hungarian dance by Brahms. <laughs> Here, let me see if I can get a bit closer to here. Uh, Hungarian dance by Brahms. Uh, two other, three other songs as well. There's one song that's from the Philippines. Here, let me get closer to my laptop, actually. I should be able to read it off my laptop. Yeah. There's the Kundaman from the Philippines, which is like a traditional folk dance. But everything else is, you know, uh, we've got Brahms, we've got uh, a couple of songs that are popular at the time. Uh, uh, a hulu hulu dance from Miami, <laughs> a Hawaiian rattle dance with the Queenie, uh, native folk dances for uh, to honor a group of members from the USS or from the SS Empress of Britain World Cruise in 1936, and then you get to the menu, and the menu is equally misrepresentative or or uh, minor marginalizing of what's available in the Philippines. About the only things that you could identify as coming from Filipino agriculture are the mango frappe to start, and let's see, the cafe noir at the end, the, the, the coffee, and a bamboo shoot salad. But everything else in between, ripe and green olives, India relish, salted pili, salted pili nuts, that's Filipino, uh, uh, California celery, consomme uh, dove, uh, a sherry, uh, chicken gumbo soup, suprema lapu lapu a la mamier. Uh, braised sweetbread souplouche, uh, roasted larded tenderloin of beef with mushroom sauce, squab chicken and casserole, sides of French string beans and butter, spring carrots a la vichy, and new potatoes risole. So you're not going to find your adobo or pansi or your white rice anywhere on this menu. So thanks. It gets even more pronounced when you look at the advertisements that are coming out as well at the same time. So this is Heinz ketchup of, uh, where is it, Pennsylvania? Heinz is in Pennsylvania. And um, I would read it in Tagalog, but I don't want to make Dulce's uh, <laughs> ears burn. <laughs> but uh, I, I did translate, sorry, go back one. And uh, I'll translate actually what, what, uh, what the blue text says. Enjoy the quite delicious taste of Heinz tomato ketchup on your food. Enjoy the taste if you mix the soup, meat, fish, rice, and other foods common in Filipino homes. You will always have a bottle on the table at mealtime, available to buy at stores. So basically, add Heinz tomato ketchup to anything that you're going to serve, and it'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> now, the next slide, I actually wanted to zoom in a bit. And this is a, a bit of co-option of some of the symbols of, of common in, in the Philippines to show a party, but it's being shown alongside uh, a giant bottle of, of Heinz tomato ketchup. So lechon, which is where we got the name of the lecture today, is this guy right here. It's a big roasted pork. Uh, there's a couple of other things that any Filipino would be able to recognize. The bahay kopa, uh, it's like vernacular architecture in the Philippines made out of uh, bamboo and, and native plants. Uh, there's a sankadan down here. It's like a, 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 a clay pot that's like slowly steaming. And the two figures that are, that are doing the cooking, they're not wearing uh, like barong tagalog. They're not wearing formal wear. They're wearing like peasant wear to be blunt. You know, this is stuff that you're just gonna wear when you're going out on Sunday to go do groceries. 
Um, this is something that anyone, any reader, should be able to identify with because they grew up around there. But these readers are literate Tagalog. They're middle class and they're upper class, and they're figuring out that if they buy Heinz tomato ketchup, they'll be able to hang with American imperialists. You know, like, they'll be able to show that they understand what American culture is like because they can eat American food. Okay. Next slide. Same thing is going on here. Uh, this is an ad for Del Monte Royal and Cherries. And uh, I'll translate, it's a kind of a long thing. <laughs> Uh, fresh from the fruit farms of sunny California to your home. You can have ripe and juicy fruit in your home thanks to Del Monte. You probably read about the rich and the fruit farms of California. Good cherries, grapes, peaches are super abundant. You open a can of Del Monte and uh, Queen Anne cherries, love and picked at the full maturity of their tastes, beneficial and wholesome for you. Hand them to children for dessert. Always have them at home for, for sweet desserts. <laughs> Make sure it's the true Del Monte the best. Leave it and try one now. Okay? So, yeah, it's Which standard advertising. Which years are these uh, advertisements? Uh, these are the mid 1920s. So, uh, they're appearing in a, this is a very good question actually. They're appearing in a, in a uh, magazine that's basically the time life equivalent of the Philippines called UIY. It's the most popular uh, uh, magazine in the Gala <laughs> and with the translation in Visaya as well for the, for the middle part of the country. But um, the reason why this advertisement is up here is the artwork is also telling a story as well. And the artwork, uh, it's, it's kind of like a Mona Lisa thing. There's, there's a quadrant, okay? And the, the, top, the, the top half are scenes from California, uh, and the bottom half are scenes from the Philippines. So on the top you have someone picking the cherries in presumably Central California. Uh, you move over to the, to the side, there's a cannery there and there's a ship leaving the cannery full of cans of Queen Anne cherries. Then they arrive, and they're in the Philippines, a place for another Baha'i Kabul. And there's a child and a mother walking along a path back to their house, and she's carrying on her head a basket full of fresh fruits and presumably a can of Queen Anne cherries as well. So, so Del Monte's, they're, they're thinking strategically here, you know, just as, as, as Heinz is trying to position themselves within Filipino vernacular and domestic cooking. They're doing the same.